And this webinar is sponsored by Close the Bay and the UC Master Gardener Program. I will be your host today. We have a few pre-submitted questions that people have sent us in the past few days. We're gonna start by answering those and working through some of those. I wanted to give you also just a brief overview of Flows the Bay before we get into this. Um, Flows the Bay, otherwise known as the San Mateo County Pollution Prevention Program, was started in 1990 to reduce pollution flowing to the bay and the ocean. Water pollution, water pollution degrades surface waters, making them unsafe for drinking and fishing and other activities that we enjoy in the county. Um, and Flows to Bay's goal is to educate residents um, and provide resources to residents that work towards the goal of reducing stormwater pollution for the betterment of the community and our local environment. Um, stormwater pollution is intricately tied to the activities that we all engage in at home. Um, and one of the, the top pollutants affecting waterways in San Mateo County are pesticides and fertilizers, um, practices that, that are used on kind of residential properties. Um, pollution from these sources can happen in a number of ways, but um, one of the most common ways that pesticides and fertilizers get into waterways is from application before rains, uh, waterings, or heavy winds. And when these chemicals run off your property, they go into storm drains, uh, which transport water untreated to local creeks in the bay and the ocean. Um, so integrated pest management is a strategy that, that we have close to Bay promote um, because it works to keep pests at manageable levels and has the least environmental impact. When we have a pest problem and we approach it from the integrated pest management framework, we consider solutions through a combination of potential controls. Um, pesticides are maybe one part of that solution, but they're the last option we consider. Um, first, we consider things like biological controls, which are things that either attack or outcompete the pests we're looking to manage. These can be natural predators, parasites, or pathogens. Um, almost everything kind of out there has something that can bring it down, and part of the, the fun part of solving pest issues is understanding um, and trying to figure out kind of that natural predator. The second thing we can do is, is uh, implement some cultural controls. So those are the behaviors and kind of the, the things that we can put in place. Um, generally speaking, pests tend to thrive in very specific environments and sometimes changing environmental conditions and altering them in very small ways um, can make a big difference in, in stopping them. Um, so these are things like watering schedules and, and just small, small kind of like adaptations that you can implement. The next um, kind of way of um, or, or control that we have with integrated pest management is our mechanical and physical controls. controls. Um, so these are things that either kill pests directly, block them out of your house, or make them the environment unsuitable for, for infestation. These are things like traps and screens, um, even mulch for things like weed management. Um, and then the last control are chemical controls. These are pesticides. Um, again, these should, these are, this is a control that we kind of use as a last resort. Um, I'm sure the master gardeners will touch on this in some of their answers to, to questions that have been submitted, but um, it's important to remember that pesticides should be used by carefully following the instructions on the bottle and, and just being very mindful of when you're, you're applying these things, not applying them before rains, not applying them um, directly before you're going to be watering your garden, um, and not applying them on, on very windy days. Um, again, the health of the ocean and the bay are, are intertwined with kind of responsible pollution prevention practices, and we all play a part in that. Um, in the FAQ that I am going to send out with um, answers to questions that we don't get to in this webinar, I'll be sending that, that out um, in the next week. Um, I'll also be including resources that we've published on Close to Bay and that the Master Gardeners have published on their website um, about IPM and local pest control operators who are, are trained in this practice. Um, that's, that's a brief introduction to Close to Bay and who we are. Um, next, I'll introduce the Master Gardener program. Uh, the UC Master Gardeners are a volunteer led organization. They're trained and certified at the UC uh, University of California. Um, 
provide community service and educational outreach that helps home gardeners and community organizations um, in their local areas garden sustainably and create healthy environments. Um, we have partnered with the Master Gardeners for the past two years to hold tabling events at local hardware stores throughout the, the county. You may have seen us near the table that's, that's pictured on your screen here um, or had a conversation with us about less toxic pesticides. And today we have three wonderful volunteers joining us. We have Barbara, Janice, and Susan, and also a, a special guest, Igor. Um, they will be answering the questions you have, starting with those that were submitted prior to the event. Um, so without further ado, let's dive into some of those questions. Um, our first question, this is a pre-submitted question and I, I lumped them together because they were both two questions about gophers. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass this one to Janice because Janice is an expert in vertebrate pests. Um, so I'll read these out loud. The first question is, how can we remove gophers and slugs effectively? We use chicken wire cages to protect roots when planting new trees, but it did not work. With traps, we catch some gophers, but it's rare. Can you prov and the second question is, can you provide pointers on mitigating gophers in the yard? It's been challenging since bordering neighbors have varying degrees of garden maintenance. So I feel like even if we get, or successfully get rid of them, will they come back? Um, so Janice, I'll pass this one to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm supposedly the um, vertebrate pest expert in San Mateo County because I have trapped over 400 gophers in a three and a half month period of time. So I guess that's why they label me the gopher expert. So um, first of all, when you, you need to identify the pest. A lot of people come to me and say, oh, I have this terrible gopher problem, can you help me? And I look at their yard and, it, and I see moles and I don't see gophers and moles are a different animal. So first, the important thing is to identify the pest. A gopher will eat your plants. A mole will eat insects and worms. They don't harm your plants unless they aerate the soil too much and create too much airspace around the roots, for instance. So to identify a gopher mound versus a mole mound, um, a gopher mound is usually a crescent shape with a hole in the middle or a plugged hole in the middle. They always have some kind of hole visible, either plugged or open. And a mole, on the other hand, has mounds that look more like volcanoes. They just push the dirt up and it drops down, no visible holes. They also will tunnel above, uh, on the ground level, making above ground tunnel systems if the ground is very soft. So that would be a mole. So you gotta pick your battles. Moles are harder to, to deal with and abate, and you know they're best left alone if you can handle the mess. Gophers, on the other hand, will eat your vegetables and your plants. Um, so in terms of uh, natural predators, let me first mention feral cats. They are wonderful at, um, at catching gophers. And you can actually contact Heading Home Animal Rescue. I think it's based in Aptos and you can actually adopt a feral cat. Um, you can't go to in local humane, humane societies because they will not let you adopt a cat that is let outside, just so you know that. Um, dogs also can, can trap or, you know, go after gophers, but they make more of a mess. So you usually don't want a dog digging up your backyard. You can also plant gopher resistant plants to kind of fend them off out of your area. Um, but keep in mind, they love to tap roots like poppies and bulbs and, and the exception to the bulbs would be daffodils and amaryllis. They usually don't go after daffodils and amaryllis, but they go after tap roots. So just keep that in mind when you're planting your plants. And um, so if you have a very expensive plant that they love, for instance, formiums and roses, or root veggies, then it's best to protect them with some kind of wire barrier, by barrier or trap them, which I'll discuss in a minute. And also, um, they don't, they tend not to like succulents that much. Um, they will attack some agaves and that sort of thing, but for the most part, they usually don't eat succulents. And California natives are usually a good bet as well. So getting on to protecting your plants with uh, wire. The first question alludes to the fact that he used chicken wire, and I never recommend chicken wire, but first of all, it's too big. It's one inch in diameter, 
you need at least three quarter, a minimum of three, maximum of three quarter inch wire. Half inch is even better. And that should be heavy galvanized wire, not, not pliable chicken wire that rusts out in a couple of years. These other wires like half inch hardware cloth wire or the um, gopher wire, that'll last about 15 years in the soil. Stainless steel will last forever. So just keep that in mind when you're deciding on wire barriers or cages. Uh, and I never recommend caging a tree. The only time I've ever caged a tree is with using half inch aviary wire, which will rust out in a couple of years and it's just protecting the young tree roots. There is no cage on the market big enough for a tree. You will eventually girdle those roots and the tree will eventually probably die because of the tight compaction of the roots. So please tr do not cage your trees on a long-term basis. It's not advisable. Um, let's see, there's horizontal wire berries you can put, put under turf, but that needs to go down about two or three inches below the turf. And that needs to be the same type of wire I just, just discussed. You can do it, an underground vertical fence that needs to go down at least two or three feet deep and about six or 12 inches above the ground. And that will usually keep your gophers out of the area of your yard. Um, I, there are some diagrams we'll be sending to you later after this presentation so you can view how that's done. Uh, but ideally trapping is the best alternative and, and I'll refer you to um, some YouTube videos that you'll get later after this presentation. There's some links that you'll get. And you can view me trapping using the cinch brand method. And there's Thomas Whitman from Gophers Limited who also uses this method. And I find it to be very successful. Professional gopher trappers will use gophinator traps, which are stainless steel and don't rust. But you have to dig a big hole to use them. So just keep that in mind. Uh, they're also very effective. So gophers are easy to trap and moles again are not very easy to trap. And you can make a big dent in the population. When I trapped those 400 gophers on my six acres, I eventually saw green grass again. So keep that in mind. You can deal with them by trapping and keeping them at bay that way. Irrigated yards will attract more gophers as well. And barren strips will detract <laughs> or, de or de deter them, I should say. So if you put barren strips of concrete or rock areas or something, they're less likely to cross that to get to your yard. And so I think I've covered just about everything in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Janice. Okay. Um, definitely looking forward to seeing that video of you trapping <laughs> or setting up traps. Um, and yeah, we'll send out resources um, that Janice has mentioned in the FAQ we send out early next week. Um, so thank oh, you. Thank and you. was there a slug question associated with that too? Um, there, yeah, there was. Uh, removing slugs effectively. Oh, so um, should, should that be addressed now? I um, think we have another question involving slugs coming up. Um, okay. So we'll save it for the next question. Okay, great. All right, the next question we have is about, uh, there are two about lemon trees. One is keeping Meyer lemon trees safe from pests. Um, and then somebody else has a question about uh, lemon trees and cherry trees that are growing locally. Um, I assume this is in San Mateo County, but I, I know that there may be some ver a variation in the types of lemon trees that grow on the, the coast and the bayside. Um, Susan, do you want to take this one? Sure, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, we do have a problem with fruit trees because we often don't get the chill hours that are necessary. Uh, in terms of lemon trees, the most popular ones in our area be the Meyer and the Eureka, um, but those are um, those are pretty thorny. But keeping the Meyer lemon tree safe from pests involves first good cultivation practices. You want to be liberal with ap applying the compost uh, once or twice a year. If you feed the soil, you're feeding the tree, and a healthy tree can actually fight off many pests. Um, so there's also cultivation practices. You want to pick up any lemons that drop to the ground because that will attract all kinds of pathogens and, and pesky animals. You want to manage the ants. If you have pests in your tree, 
they're often um, excreting what we call uh, sticky honeydew. That attracts the ants. The ants go up the tree and they defend those little pests from their own predators. So you wanna keep the ants away from the tree. You can do that by using a sticky band that goes around the, the, the trunk of the tree. Um, tangle, tangle foot is the name of one of those. And that will keep the ants from going up there. And then the, um, the pests are easy pickings for beneficial insects some flowering plants near your lemon tree and throughout the garden. These will attract beneficial insects such as parasitic wasps, lace wings, lady beetles, hoverflies, etc. Um, so they'll feed on the flowers and they will also go in the trees and look for those bad pests and eat them. You can use oil sprays such as neem. Those uh, suffocate the pests and they also repel many common pests but they can um, harm bees. So make sure you don't apply during the day when the bees are out. Do it in the, in the evening or early morning or at night. And that's the best way to uh, keep your Meyer lemon tree safe. In terms of the lemon trees and cherry trees that grow in our areas, I said there's a problem getting the fruits, particularly with cherry trees because of our lack of chill hours. Lemon trees are a little bit easier. The Eureka and Lisbon lemons do grow well, but as I um, said, they are pretty thorny, so they're more difficult to prune, or at least unpleasant to prune, and I've got the wounds to prove it. Um, the improved Meyer lemon is a pretty good all-around choice. It has good fruit. If you, I know some people prefer the Eureka to the Meyer, um, and it's, it's pretty resistant, and it has, it has real fragrant, nice blossoms as well. So it's a good all-around choice for the lemon. In terms of the ornamental cherries, um, there's the pink star, the Ben Hoshi, which is a very lovely uh, type of cherry. And if you like the weeping style with the branches that drape down so gracefully, there's the Akabono and the weeping Higan cherries. Now for actual fruiting cherries, I have heard, I've not experienced with them, that the fairly recently introduced Mini Royal and Royal Lee are doing pretty well in our area. They take many fewer hours of chill um, and they also can pollinate each other. So those might be choices too, if you have a taste for cherries. All right, thank you, Susan. Appreciate the answers. Um, moving on to the next pre-submitted question. Um, this, there were two questions, again, they came from one person this time. Um, first question is, how to protect plants from the foggy and windy conditions at night? So I assume they're either on the coast side or up in San Francisco. Um, so their second question was, how do you know when your root vegetables, like garlic, radish, beets, uh, are ready to eat? Barbara, do you wanna field this one? Yes, sure. Um, actually, I wrote things down and I just thought I would use my notes to help me make sure I said things correctly. Sure. Anyway, um, for the fog, how to protect from the fog. One of the best ways would be to get a fog resistant plant, but that's not always um, possible. So I guess the other thing is to let it get as much sun as possible and prune it. One of the things is not to sprinkle it, just to have a ground watering system and water and not to water in the evening because that sort of um, danger endangers the plant because of the wind at night. And then um, from the wind, that's for the fog. And for the wind, gardens on the north and west side of a yard are the windiest. Most of our winds come in from the ocean in that direction, and that's where it would be the windiest and probably maybe even the foggiest in your yard. One way, <coughs> excuse me, one way would be to put shrubs or open fences to let a little bit of air come in or use lattice work. Another thought is to build like a fence, a very open fence, and put vines on it to let air through it. So that would be one way to break down the wind. The other thing would be to use a 50% shade cloth on the plant so that the wind doesn't kind of wish it away. 
and sometimes it's just a good idea to get a very hardy plant. Uh, the next question, what do you do? How do you know when the vegetables are ready to eat? Well, for beets, when the beet shoulders protrude the soil, that's how you know when the beets are ready. For garlic, the tops will fall over and begin to get brown and yellow. And that's the time to dig out the garlic, not to pull it out. As to radishes, it's really kind of interesting. You're supposed to record the date you plant the radish and then look on the seed package and it says the expected date of um, maturity. And that's usually about 25 days from the day you planted it. Now in the winter, if you plant radishes for the winter, usually it's about 50 days. But what's key to knowing when to pick a radish is knowing, recording the date you plant it and then figuring out 25 days in the summer or 50 days in the winter. Great, thank you, Barbara. Appreciate the response. Um, our next questions are about rats. Um, people are, seem to be having rat issues in their gardens. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that Mark had a question in the FAQ about rats, so maybe we can lump, um, include Mark's question in this answer. Uh, he, he asks, has anyone else been having issues with rats this year, possibly due to restaurant closures, um, setting traps? Um, the other questions are, about rats as garden pests and, and whether there's any way to stop them successfully in the garden to protect the produce. Um, and then also about uh, keeping vermin, so I assume this is, this is vertebrate pests as well, um, out of fruit trees. Uh, this person used netting, but it, it didn't seem uh, to help unless it was wrapped so thickly that, that the tree could, could barely get enough sunlight. Uh, Janice, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Yes, rats are becoming a real nuisance in urban and suburban areas because um, we leave our, our trash around and we leave dog food out and bird seed and all of those things attract rats. So um, the first things you can do to discourage rats would be to bring your dog food in at night, to, uh, don't use bird seed feeders if you can help it, um, make sure your compost piles are covered well, trash is tightly uh, secured, down, those things will will discourage rats from coming around in the first place. Now keep in mind they, fo they forage at night, so if you want to find evidence of them, go out with a flashlight, go along your fence line, look for the little critters running around on your top of your fences or on the, against your fences or against your house. And keep in mind these little guys can gnaw through just about anything. When you want to keep them out, wood will not keep them out. Plastic will not keep them out for the most part. You need to have something that's heavy duty wire or heavy duty plastic to keep them from gnawing through it. They can jump three feet in the air and they can jump four feet horizontally. So keep your branches away from, you know, your tree branches away from fences and roof lines where they can jump from one structure to another. Um, they they can burrow down four feet in the ground and they can even squeeze through a half inch of space. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at wire gate, at wire distance. It has, has to be a minimum of a half inch uh, or a maximum, I should say, um, maximum of half inch. And then um, there's two types of rats. We've got roof rats and Norway rats. The roof rats are up, in the, up high, the Norway rats are down low and they're larger, um, but you kind of abate them in the same way. You, you know, if you know you have rats, if you hear attic noises, you've got roof rats, for instance. Um, if you see, a, you know, debris piles that look like nesting areas, then you've probably got Norway rats. You, first of all, you want to remove dense vegetation, ivy, old agapanthus, anything they can hide in. And then prune back those tree branches, that helps. And as I said, take all those other, um, do all those ha other habitat modifications. And then rodent proof your home with screens that are impenetrable to rats you know half inch or quarter inch even um the you know they use quarter inch wire for your vents because half inch they could possibly squeeze through and um make sure your your roof vents are covered and your spark arresters are in place 
and and in terms of netting against them it netting just doesn't work because they can they can you know eat through netting pretty easily and it's messy and it, it's often in oftentimes ineffective the best way to keep them out of gardens is with enclosed garden beds with the um, you know the quarter inch gauge wire mesh and that that does take a lot of effort granted and we'll send you a, a, maybe some photos of what one person did to protect their garden beds with this wire panels. You can also build panels um, framed with wood for trees. I've seen people do it. It's a, it's a big effort, but it can be done. And you can create four panels in a top and then wire them together. It, I mean, that is one way of deal, dealing with it, but it is, um, you know, you'll spend a lot of time doing it. And then uh, in terms of trapping, that's kind of your best approach. Um, there's an APCO electronic rodent zapper that you can plug in or use batteries with, and that's very effective. There's snap traps, like wooden snap traps and plastic ones. And then there's you know a method to where you leave them. You leave them um, either perpendicular to a wall or horizontally back to back on top of a fence railing and leave them for a couple of days, let them get used to them, and then put bait in there. Usually like peanut butter works well, but make sure your other animals don't have access to it or they'll get snapped. Um, and you can nail wooden traps to beams, and there's also one that is used, um, like that electronic one is called Good Nature A24 Automatic Trap, and it uses CO2 cartridges with a plunger. Very effective for killing rats, but it, be careful because it can also kill squirrels. So I think that's it in a nutshell. All right, thank you, Janice. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, the next question we have was submitted and it's about it's about roses. Um, this person's wondering how to get uh, rusty leaves off the roses and mold that has developed on an apple tree. Susan, do you wanna take this one? Susan, I think you are muted right now. Thanks, I was muted because I have a dog that barks at this time for the mailman. <laughs> so no look out for that. <laughs> anyway, rust on the roses is a problem in many parts of our county. I live in Half Moon Bay, so um, most of the roses have black spot and rust, etc. You start with good cultivation practices. First uh, is the planting. Make sure they're planted where they get lots of sun. Plant them with spacing and keep them more open with pruning to get good air circulation. And don't water them overhead. Water at the soil level because the rust needs some kind of water to, um, to spread and take root there. Uh, then you want to remove all the diseased leaves from the plant and importantly from the soil because the rust can live there. You want to compost, 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 compost. <laughs> um, keep compost there and mulch a little bit over it because your compost is alive. If the plants are healthy, they can actually do quite a bit themselves to repel pests and uh, diseases. If necessary, you can use fungicides such as Serenade, which is an, a natural um, uh, product using um, actual fungus, fun fungus, or sulfur, which has been used for probably thousands of years. But if rust persists, you might be better off to replace your roses, sadly, with a resistant variety. And those are usually listed on the label or the nursery can help you to find those or you can simply Google. And this is particularly important if you're like me um, on the coast side, because you're just not gonna get rid of the damp, cool nights, which is just perfect for rust. Uh, so for the apple tree, Without, uh, similar to the roses, without good heat and sun, the apple trees are prone to powdery mildew. You see it a lot. The leaves get a little distorted. You can see the powdery mildew on it, and powdery mildew is a descriptive term too. If you don't have the heat and the sun, fungicide sprays will be necessary, but it might be best, again, to replace or to plant apple trees that are resistant uh, and those would include the Red Delicious, the Stamen Wine Sap, uh, and the Golden Delicious, Brayburn, Macintosh, Granny Smith are also fairly resistant. So those are pretty good apple varieties to plant in our area. Uh, neem oil 
is effective against the powdery mildew and serenade again will work if you could but you need to coat both sides of the leaves so spraying sometimes uh, isn't too possible if you have a big old um, bushy apple tree so again um, keeping it thinned out a little bit to get plenty of air and sun will help you keep them healthy uh, you can prune out branches from the center crossing branches and that will help open it up as well so good luck with the rust and the mildew Thank you, Susan. Appreciate it. Um, the next question we have is about ants. Um, how do I control ant invasions in the garden? They crawl all over me when I'm gardening and nothing eats them. Um, Barbara, do you want to take this one? I know Susan also had some things she can add, but do you want to? Yeah, um, actually it depends upon the kind of ant that you have. There are a gazillion different kinds of ants. There are Argentine ants and they're what I call sugar ants, and they're ants that are inside the house and outside the house. Um, what I have found that works for ants is, um, it's a little bit unscientific, but it seems to work. I've um, used um, sometimes Windex, or I've used just soap, but, um, Basically, you have to use um, mulch a lot and barriers and insecticide baits or sprays around the base of plants. The Argentine ants can be controlled with a um, farnesol, which is a behavior modifying chemical that affects their, their gland, their sex glands, it's a ferrone. And um, other, other kinds of baits include boric acid, which is a natural product, we all use it, or a liquid borate, or one suggestion would be a half to 1% of borate in sugar and water solution. And that's apparently very good for getting Argentine ants. They come in at it and they drown. The UC website has a pest note on ants and that's a very good resource. And one thing to remember is that you want whatever you use to be very slow acting because you want the ant to get back to its nest so that it doesn't die along the way. For uh, container plants, if you put some sticky material or something slippery around the container or a mode of water, then, or oil, then the ant can't really get to the plant. Another thought was to spray the soil sample or the drenching soil around the nest, which includes, which I know an IPM person isn't supposed to say, an insecticide, but something that won't harm the other plants and won't harm the water, but it reduces the population of the ants. But ants come out at different times of the year. They come out in the spring, they come out in the fall. And um, it depends upon, actually I've had ants because of dog food. So you just have to be very careful. And everything that Janice said about rats applies to ants. They sort of like the same uh, food to eat. Yeah. Thanks, Barbara. Susan, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think it is important, as Barbara was saying, to find their food source and go after that. If they're climbing up the trees and the bushes, put that tangle foot around it and that'll cut that off for them. Um, you can use a spray like this orange guard. Uh, not anywhere by water, but if you find where they're nesting, you can spray it around that, similar to diatomaceous earth. And that, that, that won't um, like take it back in and kill the queen, but it will definitely reduce them. Um, and, and those are uh, two other techniques to just, once you find where they're eating and living, then you can start you know, tackling them there. So follow those ants when they're crawling all over you, follow them back to where they came from. Another thing that I've done, not to advertise, but Grant's ants, if you take it out of that metal container and then cut up that little piece, be very careful to wear gloves, and put pieces of that around wherever it is you're trying to protect. The ants will go there. 
somehow they don't know that they're supposed to go into that little hole that is the container of Grant's Ants. But if you take that little cube out, it works great. Great. Thank you both for the answers. Appreciate it. Uh, the next question we have is one that was submitted by somebody down in Moss Beach. Um, they live across the road from San Vincent Creek and Himalayan blackberry has been an issue invading their native plant garden. Um, Barbara, do you want to field this one? Um, I can try. <laughs> Blackberries are really a, kind of a very, very invasive plant. And one thing is, even if you cut them back, they just want to grow all the more vigorously. The whole thing is you have to dig them out. You just have to dig it out and just keep digging and digging and digging. That's, it seems to be in all the research that I've done, digging them out seems to be about the only way that really helps. Um, Roundup, Roundup is just something you don't want to use. It's been found to be quite toxic and it has a very long residence time in the soil and you don't want it being washed out either to the bay or the, the ocean. So as far as um, I know, the best way to get rid of blackberry is to just dig out the roots. Now, I think Janice may have had more experience with that since I live in the city and I don't have that initial problem, although I have seen a lot of blackberry bushes in the Presidio. Oh, yes. you know, want me to chime in? I all I can tell you about blackberries is I just keep digging and digging and digging. That's that's the story of my life. That's that's all I have Persistent to say. Persistent plant. <laughs> all right, thank you both. Appreciate it. Um, the next question we have is another one that's pre-submitted. Uh, this is about diatomaceous earth. Um, they have little flying bugs that come out of their their lawn when they go across it. Um, and they put down diatomaceous earth to try to take care of those bugs, but they want to make sure it's okay for their for pets um, as well as other people in their yard. Um, Susan, is this one you want to take? Okay. Well, diatomaceous earth, is, uh, especially the food grade, is quite safe for uh, dogs and people and mammals. Uh, so that is something that you can use. Now, it doesn't work for the flying insects because it, what it does is it work on crawling insects. They crawl through the diatomaceous earth that kind of chops up their legs and messes them up. Um, so it's good for caterpillars and larvae and beetles and things like that. Um, it's sadly, um, often bees are crawling around on the ground too, particularly our bumblebees, and it can harm them as well. Uh, but you might have fungus gnats they're common in lawns and they like it when there's rotting vegetation. So if you have a lawn that's too wet or too moist, um, they can be down at the bottom where it's, um, where, where it's rotting and they can be laying their eggs. And in that case, there will be larva and the diatomaceous earth would be effective against the larva of the, of the fungus gnats. So that diatomaceous earth would be good there. You could also try the organic fungal spray BTI um, that's, um, that's um, Bacillus thumb, oh, I can't remember. It's also called the H14 uh, strain. The predatory uh, nematodes might be your best choice as they also keep other pests in check too without harming the bees. So um, to make sure you, you I can identify and best treat it, see if you can capture some of those. You could send a picture or uh, take a sample into our helpline and that information will be provided to you later. Uh, see what they're living on if you can, if they're living on dog poo or dropped fruit. If you remove those things, you might take care of your problems and it might be a seasonal problem. It might go away on its own. So good luck with that. Right, thank you, Susan. Um, I just want to acknowledge that it is 10.54 um, and this presentation was originally supposed to go to 11. Uh, I touch base with the Master Gardeners, and since we started a little late, um, we'll probably extend this presentation to about 11.10 or 11.15. Um, so keep your questions coming, and we'll just continue kind of working through these slides. 
Um, I'm going to send out a link to the survey that we'd like you to, to fill out. I'll also send the survey link and follow up email um, in case you lose it. Uh, but if you could fill it out by Sunday, that'd be really great. And again, you'll be entered uh, into the raffle for the, the $100 gift card to either Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Lingzo Garden Materials, or Hassett Hardware. So whichever one you would like, if you win the raffle, you will get a $100 gift card to one of those stores. Um, the next, so we have another slide. I wanted to address a question Vicky put in the Q&A. Um, and I'm, Master Gardeners, if this is not something that, that you know a lot about, that's fine. Um, we, can, we can follow up with Vicky after the presentation. Um, but she asks about um, the difference between lawn and artificial turf. Um, she has two young boys who need uh, a backyard to play and thus cannot zero escape. Um, so I'm wondering if, if any of you have thoughts on, on lawn versus kind of an artificial turf. Okay. Barbara? Or... Yeah, I have one because it's been found that at least for football players in schools where they have artificial turf, even though it may be a lot cleaner and not less maintenance, children or when you fall, it just, it's a lot slippery and it's just not a very safe um, playing field, so to speak. Artificial turf, I know it, you find it for dog parks and that's one thing, but I think for kids to play on it, even though it seems a lot cleaner, I think it's just not as safe as regular grass. So let me let me try this a little bit, Sasha and, and Master Gardeners. Uh, I think the thank you, Barbara, for that. And I, I think for most homeowners, the, the question really is going to be, do you want to care for a lawn? And that's why I put up this uh, guide to healthy lawns. So especially if it's a small lawn that you're going to maintain specifically for ch children to play on, I would follow this guide and decide essentially, is, is this something you want to invest time and effort doing? And if the answer is yes, then I think Barbara's uh, comments apply quite directly. Yeah, you want a natural lawn. Now, if for whatever reason you are not able or not willing to maintain a lawn, then the artificial turf is an option. Again, as Barbara pointed out, there are some real drawbacks and artificial turf also requires maintenance. People often think that it doesn't require any maintenance. That's not true. You still have to vacuum up the dirt. You still have to refresh the, the rubber base that goes into it and so on. So there is a bit of maintenance and folks who sell artificial turf can fill you in on the details of that. Um, I think for, for small areas where, if you, especially if you have water available, um, natural turf offers some advantages. But again, I would refer you to this guide to healthy lawns. It will kind of tell you what's, what it is you're getting into with a natural lawn. Um, and again, we're talking mostly about lawn for play. If you want lawn to just look at, then there are a lot of lower water use alternatives. Um, some of them are actually grass, lower water use grass, um, but they don't take traffic as well. So again, if we're talking about play lawn, this is really, I would really start with this guide to healthy lawns and get some idea of what's involved. Um, certainly it's it's an option. It's probably a good option for, for play. I think we'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but this is the website ipm.ucnr.edu, tools, and then turf. And if you just put in guide, UC guide to healthy lawns, you'll find it on Google. Thanks, Igor. And I, I will also include a link to um, this page in the FAQ uh, document and email I send out um, this coming week. So if you, if you don't have time or, or the ability to, to type down that URL, um, I'll also send this to you. So don't worry about that. Um, Igor, would you mind um, passing the, the screen share back to me? There you go. Thanks. Can you see the presentation? I think you have to reshape. Ah, okay. Let me see Barbara. All right. Can you see that now? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Great. So thank you for that. You had this one. Um, so the next question we have is about soil fertility. 
Uh, what is the best way to improve the fertility of the house and soil? And how quickly can I expect to start seeing better growth in my vegetables? Uh, Janice, do you want to take this one? Um, yes. Um, as uh, Susan already mentioned, uh, compost, compost, compost. That's what we master gardeners do. That's our mantra is feed your soil, not your plants. If you feed your soil life, those little microbes and bacteria, you know, the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, and all the insects associated with them, then your soil will be healthy and happy and translate that to the health and happiness of your plants. So um, yeah, the key to success, to success, I think, is through compost. And do Google soil food web to learn more about that process. There's this symbiotic relationship going on in the earth. We don't want to really disturb it too much. We want to keep our microbes happy and healthy. And then they in turn provide the nutrients to our plants when the plants need them the most and in a sustainable manner versus a non-sustainable manner, which is typically um, synthetic fertilizers. You can over apply synthetic fertilizers and then do some damage to the environment, the waterways, you know, the groundwater and even plant life and animal life. So um, your safer bet is compost and organic um, fertilizers. If you need to use fertilizers, there's some basic organic fertilizers you can use there. But compost is ideally the, the best long term solution for that. And you can see results very quickly, especially if you work the compost into the soil. And, and then let it, let it sit there in a damp you know, environment for a while and get those microbes and get the, get the soil food web going. But you can plant right away if the compost is actually aged appropriately and, and see results right away. Okay, okay. Thank you, Janice. Uh -huh. Susan, oh, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that to leave the leaves. Don't blow the leaves off. It will do two things. One, it will blowing will dry your soil. Um, and two, it will remove the leaves. And the leaves are nature's way of, of fertilizing the soil. A tree drops its own food, a bush drops its own food in its leaves. So leave them there and they will add those microbes. And when you want earthworms in your soil for making it more spongy to accept the water, uh, the earthworms feed on those microbes. And that's what Janice was talking about. You want those microbes in there. They'll attract these insects that create a beautiful texture in your soil. Yeah, actually compost will improve any type of soil, whether it's sandy or clay. It will help add a stickiness to sandy soil and it will help aerate um, heavy clay soils. So it's good for all types of soils. Great, thank you both. And, and Susan, um, SL asked in the, the Q&A whether they should pull mushrooms or, or leave them growing in the yard. And I, this seems to relate to whether or not we should be leaving leaves. So do you have a... There's some mushrooms I pull because I eat them, but <laughs> <laughs> the rest I'm happy to leave. If you don't like the idea that they're there, you might just sort of chop them up and leave them around. Yeah, those are good things. Sometimes if you see that they're an attractant to an ant or something, then pull them up. But if you see they're doing no harm, then they're going to do good. But we were discovering more and more scientifically that the hyphae, all those sort of roots, of the mushrooms are communicating with roots of the trees. It's, there's a whole exchange going on of nutrients and information and food, uh, and it all keeps this um, food web happy and healthy and alive. It's an amazing alive process. And just a quick comment that pulling mushrooms does not actually eradicate the, the fungus. So. Um, again, I would refer folks to the Healthy Lawns Guide. Um, as, as Susan mentioned, mushrooms are not necessarily a problem. It's simply part of the ecosystem. But even if you don't like the, the mushrooms themselves, just by removing the mushroom, you're not actually removing the fungus. It's in the soil or in the wood. So just kind of a note there. All right. Thank you, Bob. Um, I want to get to this next question because it was also asked by Lena. Um, so the, the pre-submitted question was about using neem oil to fight fungal diseases and aphids in the garden. Um, and they're generally curious about what uh, master gardeners thoughts are uh, on neem oil in general, pros and cons. And then Lena asked in the Q&A whether uh, you can spray neem oil uh, when the fruit tree is flowering and whether yeah, that's an issue. Um, Susan, do you wanna take these? 
Uh, yeah, neem oil is one of the safest pesticides and you know plant care products in the gardener's arsenal. Um, it doesn't uh, pose risks that we're uh, that we've quantified to water quality or aquatic wildlife. Its potential harm to beneficial insects is low, um, and the risk to humans and other and mammals is very low. It will harm honeybees, although it might not kill them. So just apply it again during late late hours, very early hours, or at night. Um, and also you shouldn't apply it. You know, th those are good times too, because the heat of the day, if it gets up towards 90 degrees, that neem oil can actually harm the leaves on your plant. So you have to be careful about that. Um, you need to apply it thoroughly, um, all plant surfaces. So if you have really bushy shrubs or tall trees, it can be difficult to apply it properly. Those are sort of the cons. Um, it is effective against aphids, but so is a jet of water. If you hose off those aphids, they're very unlikely to crawl back up. They're pretty much just stuck on the ground and let the ants take care of them on the ground and not on your plant. So I wouldn't use neem oil to get rid of, of aphids, just water. Uh, it is a good product for powdery mildew. It's less effective on rusts. So that's why I said earlier, you know, that you can use the neem oil for the powdery mildew, but on the, on the rose, it, it, it's not effective for the rest. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, if, I can, if I can just add a tiny little bit, um, it is exactly as Susan said, um, and I, I just want to point out that Susan mentioned that it is a pesticide. So like any pesticide, you have to read and follow the label that's on it. That's not kind of optional information. If you feel like reading it, that is the law. So what it says on the label, that's how you should apply neem oil. And it's true, it is a reduced, greatly reduced risk pesticide. It's very popular. And again, Susan did a fantastic job describing all of its uh, good qualities, but remember, it is still a pesticide and you're still obligated to read the label and follow the label. And just to point out that if you're ever wondering about the active ingredients in a pesticide and you wanna know how likely they are to harm bees or other organisms, you can actually find that on the UCIPM webpage. And here it is. This is again, ipm.ucinr.edu and the active ingredient neem oil. And you can get the ratings here to aquatic wildlife, to beneficial insects, in this case, low to honeybees, as Susan pointed out, it does have moderate risk to honeybees and then to people and other mammals, very low risk. But you can find this information for any, or for most common anyway, pesticide active ingredients on the UCIPM webpage. And I would highly recommend that. So thank you all. And I will, I will stop and turn it back to Sasha. Thanks, Igor. Actually, I'd like to add a note. It turns out that every hardware store or any place that sells any sort of pesticide has to have a material safety data sheet on site. So besides the label, which Igor mentioned, the material safety data sheet gives you, tells you all the ingredients that are in that product and the health effects and how to use it safely. And even with neem oil, if you're going to apply neem oil, you have to apply it safely, not when it's windy, and you probably should wear eye protection. And uh, just be very careful, as Igor said, to read the label, because anything you apply with a spray, you don't want to do it late in the day when it's windy, and you don't want to do it when it's very sunny to burn the plant. Right, those are great additions. Thank you, Barbara. Um, the next questions we have were submitted um, by a couple people. Um, they're all about pest damage. So the the image on the far left is a watermelon plant um, that somebody and their son planted, uh, and they're they're curious about um, what might be causing. This, this leaf damage. Um, and then the, the other person who submitted the question is growing lettuce, kale, and purple cauliflower and also was experiencing leaf damage. Um, Barbara, do you have any ideas about what might be causing the damage? Yeah, well, I sort of looked that up. I don't have those products in my yard, but it turns out it could be from um, cucumber beetles. 
And one thing um, the questioner did not ask or tell us whether or not there were other vegetables near the watermelon. Because um, if watermelons are planted near cucumbers, squash, or cantaloupe, they're more prone to these bugs and it's called a cucumber beetle. It could also be a cutworm, which is present in the soil. There's some, some, some animals or vertebrae or bugs that are in the soil, which when you start watering come to life and they could be right there coming up and eating. And uh, the best thing to use would be an insecticidal soup soap or a pyrethrin. Um, a pyrethrin comes from basically a, a plant like chrysanthemum and that's where the word comes from. And the pyrethrin is toxic to the insect nervous system and it's biodegradable. So if you do have this, you might try to get a pyrethrin, um, I hate to say it, insecticide or pesticide. And it looks like that was it, but it might be. And I think Janice, didn't you kind of agree with me on that? Um, I'm not an expert on invertebrate pests, but I have experience with my vegetables in my own yard. And um, I just plant enough for uh, to feed everything. <laughs> and so <laughs> be plentiful, be forgiving. Um, my biggest problem is birds right now, and that could be bird damage. In my yard, I had uh, charred with holes in it like that, similar to that, and it turned out to be birds. So I put up scare tape around the tops of my um, vegetables that were affected, and it immediately stopped the problem. So, um, if, and it also, if it happens to be larvae, you know, there's the BT product, the bacterium thoro something or other, then the brand name is Thuricide, if we can mention that. But so that's my experience with vegetables and holes in them. Yeah, and it turns out probably for the um, lettuce and the kale and the purple ca cauliflower, it might be a looper, which is a kind of um, caterpillar. And as Janice mentioned, Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a natural occurring bacterial. Um, disease attacks the caterpillars and it's considered organic and it's actually used quite frequently on crops and ornamental plants and even in organic agriculture so um, BT is is quite the answer for what's eating the lettuce kale and purple cauliflower oh and one other uh, comment is as Susan alluded to before um, a healthy plant is more disease and pest resistant so I noticed compost, that compost, compost, <laughs> compost, 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 and make your plants as healthy as possible. And you may not even get aphids. I, I don't get aphids in the ground. I get them in pots. So the the the, the uh, plants that are planted in the ground have more resistance because they're getting more nutrients from the soil because of all the additional soil life going on. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> Great, thank you, Beth. Um, we have one final pre-submitted question, um, and that, that will probably bring us to the close of this presentation. Um, this is a multi-part question uh, that was submitted by somebody who is looking for help um, kind of figuring out what to do with their front yard. Um, Susan, uh, I know this is, this is quite a doozy of a question, but do you want to take a stab at answering this one? Um, you're muted, Susan. And it's those dogs again. Okay, <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. Um, in terms of um, types of ground covers, we've already talked about um, turf, and there are uh, some newer varieties of turf grass that are more um, water, more water wise than the old kind. I'm not an expert on those, but um, but probably a good nursery person could help you with that. But thinking about a replacement, there's Kurapia. It starts with a K-U-R. Kurapia can be a grass replacement. It's fairly substantial. You couldn't play football on it, but you could walk around on it. Um, it will attract bees because it, it has low growing flowers. It, it gets about this thick to about this thick. 
and it's flowering. So if you have little children or a bee allergic person, maybe not so good, uh, but it's lovely and um, alive and green and is a good replacement. Uh, but you have to be rid of all the weeds um, before you plant it because it's hard to weed it once it's grown in. Other water-wise alternatives might be the more grass-like Berkeley sedge or red fescue. You can mix those together and I think it's lovely to mix in some uh, drought tolerant low growing flowers like that with like yarrow or ar arctotus, poppies, oreganos, marjorams and all of those plants you can mow when they get too unruly just mow them down. Now in terms of the kind of plant for a low to medium barrier at the edge of the lawn and sidewalk depends on the size of your property, how big and substantial you want those to be. So I have a few um, from order of from smallest to largest. You might put in a bank of these sort of small daisy bushes called Santa Barbara daisy. Those are those bloom all year long. They're very good for pollinators. Um, they attract butterflies and all kinds of great little things. Um, and they're very easy. You just shear them back once in a while. They grow all year long. They take little, little water. Another thing would be a nice bank of lavenders. Um, they're, they're lovely, they're fragrant, and uh, you can harvest the lavender, of course. There's um, a plant, a coleonema, a pink breath of heaven, that comes in a compact size, and it will get to be maybe up to three feet tall, maybe three feet wide, a few of those, they're lovely and graceful, they sort of sway in the wind, they have little flowers, those might work out well. For a more um, traditional, standard, um, you know, trim it hedge, you might try the Indian Hawthorne motto called the Indian Princess. It gets about three feet tall, beautiful pink flowers on it. Really needs little, little pruning at all unless you like the pruned look. Uh, it might take water once a week. And finally, the Skylark Ceanothus, or another small growing Ceanothus, which is beautiful for our native um, native creatures. So I'd highly recommend that. Very fragrant. It blooms in um, spring. I believe that one does. So those are ideas for that. In terms of how do you prevent weed growth, eight to ten inches of mulch. And by mulch, don't use the bark. I mean, don't use the, yeah, don't use the bark. Use the wood chips or arborist mulch, which would be a mixture of greens and brown produce from the trees. Any and if you just use three, four, or even five inches of mulch, the sun can still get there to germinate the weed seeds. If you put in the eight to 10 inches, even if weeds will come up, and they will, they're very easy to pull out because they're spindly. But that's uh, the recommended depth for mulch. And that is probably the best way to get rid of, of weeds. And if you use the bark and the arborist mulch, you're also feeding your soil, which is better. Bark um, is made to be water repellent. It's made to keep out microbes and fungus because it's the outside of a tree. It's a protective thing. So it's not necessarily the best mulch for feeding your soil. So should you ever want to garden, you can just rake that mulch away and you have beautiful friable chocolate cake soil underneath. In terms of a uh, tree for in front of your bedroom window, not sure how tall that would be, but if it were me, I would put a pineapple guava, a camellia, which you can prune to shape, a Japanese maple, how lovely, or put in a nice ornamental trellis with a light vine on it, like a clock vine or black eyed Susan, or maybe even a jasmine to get a little bit of that jasmine fragrance. Great, thank you so much, Susan. Appreciate you taking on all those questions. <laughs> um, we had, so we're, we're just about in an hour now, so we're gonna start wrapping up. Um, I know Igor has a couple of things he wants to say about the, the Master Gardener website. Um, and I think he's also gonna field this final question from one of the attendees about whether you can uh, add compost to a vegetable garden after it's growing. Yeah, and that compost question, the answer is yes, you can, um, as long as you're using actual finished compost. So we're not talking about manure, we're not talking about something strange, we're talking about good finished compost that doesn't have any kind of a bad smell or anything like that. Yes, that can be added. Don't put it on top of growing vegetables, obviously, but sort of underneath and next to them. But yes, that, that can be added to, to an actually set up garden. So great questions. 
Thank you, Master Gardeners. This was spectacular. This was our first time trying this. Um, I just thought I would uh, refer our attendees to a few resources. And this is all of the University of California websites. And I was going to start with uh, Susan answered the, the last question so well. And I thought I would just point out the UC Davis Arboretum plant list. This is the so-called Arboretum All Stars. And you can actually search that database by characteristic. You want a big plant, small plant, and so on, sun exposure. And you can find plants that really have been shown to do well in California climates. Now, we were mostly talking about uh, integrated pest management here. And I just wanted to point out the integrated pest management webpage. If you are in California, this is by far your best resource on garden, turf, and similar situation pests. And really, most of the pest information that you see in California is related to this IPM, Integrated Pest Management Program, that University of California runs. And you can click on your settings, so it's probably going to be home, garden, and turf. And then you can choose pests either by pest, if you already know what your problem is, or you can choose the pest by the plant that it's affecting. So for example, we had that problem with melons. So if you click on vegetables and then you click on, was it cantaloupes or something like that, you get a short list of pests and you can kind of step through it. I think I tried to step through it. And here you go, there's some loopers. Well, what does that look like? And again, it's a fairly short list that you have here. Um, so maybe it's loopers, does it look like that? Or maybe it's cucumber beetles, as Barbara mentioned. Is that what you're seeing? Again, the list is fairly short, so you can just click on that and see if you can find the, the problem that's that's plaguing you. There was, again, there was a mention, Barbara mentioned cutworms, same thing. You just step through this very brief list and you'll find you'll probably find the problem. There was an extensive discussion of gophers. And I just wanted to point that out and thank you, Janice, for that. So it was interesting. There were so many questions about vertebrate pests. There is a pretty good selection of vertebrate pests. If we go back to the IPM website, um, there is an entire section on vertebrate pests. So there they are. And I clicked on gophers and there's a pretty detailed description, just as Janice pointed out, there's a clear distinction between moles and gophers, as long as you know what you're looking at. There was a question about citrus, and I wanted to point out the California Backyard Orchard website, uh, which is the homeorchard.ucnr.edu. And there's you after you're on after you get on that webpage, you just select the uh, crop you're trying to grow, and it will guide you toward the resources. So as a citrus resources, if you're trying to go for say loquats, it will guide you to that, and so on and so on. So this is the Home Orchard uh, website. The active ingredient database, we talked about this uh, for, again, IPM website. If you click on pesticide information, you can get very quickly to the active ingredient website. And you can see all of this information here. Again, if you're trying to use a specific pesticide, this is a good place to go to get a sense of, or especially if you don't have the pesticide in your hands yet, you're considering buying it. You can go to this website and it will give you an idea of what the risks are to bees, to beneficial organisms, and of course to humans and uh, other vertebrates. So this is a really good, this is a really good uh, place to start before you buy a pesticide. Uh, we talked a lot about ants. There is an extensive webpage on ants. Again, you can get to this from the UCIPM website. Ant identification, what to do in an ant emergency, what to do with outdoor ants, what to do with indoor ants. I highly, highly recommend this. Even if you end up hiring a professional to manage your ants, go look at this web, web page first to get a sense of what you can expect from ant management. We talked a lot about healthy lawns, so I'm not going to go into that any more detail on that. But again, if you're at all thinking about growing turf or thinking about replacing turf, this is a great place to start. There was a question about earwigs. So there is an entire web page on earwigs. Um, and I think as somebody mentioned, yeah, it's one of those things you might need to live with, but there are also some simple sanitation measures that will reduce the earwig problems. And the final thing I wanna point out, because we had so many questions and we had so many great questions, there is in fact an entire helpline specifically intended to answer questions like these. And Barbara, Susan, and Janice are 
just some of our wonderful Master Gardeners who are very active on this Master Gardener helpline. All you do is e click this link to send an email and your question will be answered by one of our wonderful Master Gardeners. And we have a way of tracking your question so we can come back and really engage with you for as long as we need to until we've answered your question. This has worked. This has been working very well for us for four years now. We have a online tracking system and this is very much still in operation during the strange pandemic time. So please do visit our Master Gardener helpline. And uh, I think that's all for me, Sasha, uh, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Igor. Um, just again, to everybody who's um, still on the, the webinar, I will be sending out an email um, later today with a link to the survey that I posted in the chat. Um, and then this coming week, I'll be sending out an email with um, all of the questions that have been submitted and all the answers that the Master Gardeners have provided, um, as well as these resources that Igor, Igor has just um, shared and any um, there, there are also a number of resources that the Master Gardener shared with me uh, leading up to this presentation that I'll, I'll also send out for your general consumption. Um, so I think we've gone through all of the pre-submitted questions and we've answered a number of uh, questions that people have brought to the q and I want to thank everybody for attending. Thank you to the Master Gardeners. Thank you very much for all the, the research you did um, and the, the thorough answers you provided. Really appreciate your participation. Um, and the work that you do. And I want to thank everybody um, else for bringing your questions and um, and showing up for this, this little event on a Saturday. Um, and with that, I think we'll conclude the webinar. Um, keep an eye out for the emails I will send in the, the next few days with resources, the survey link, and, and just to follow up. Um, and thank you all for attending. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.